Are you a photography educator? One word, imagingdna.com. Hey, welcome to the trailer. Come on in. Today, we're on Skype with Cesar Cruz. He's an educator from Oakland. Let's hear his story. T-E-O-L-O-L, Teolol. Teolol is a, is a kind of a, a Nahuatl name, a Mexica name that, that one of my elders gave me. Uh, it means zero. I'm a zero. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's because um, uh, in Mayan communities, zero, um, Mayans are given the credit that they invented the concept of, the mathematical concept of zero. And zero simply means balance negative integers, positive integers, but in life, the balance between that which happens to us, which is negative and positive. And so I was given that name to try to find balance. So that's still Lola. And Olin means movement. Uh, these are now what uh, Aztec or Mexica terms. Um, and Olin is also my son's name, uh, my, my firstborn, uh, but it simply means movement. Oh, that's so balance. So if you combine them, yeah, the, kind of the movement for balance. That's cool. I love it. All right. So can you tell us about your journey thus far? It's definitely been a challenging journey, not, not a new journey. There's a lot of folks that have gone through a lot of struggle. I was born in a small village, Jalisco, Mexico, where we didn't have running water, where uh, we didn't have a television set. But believe it or not, we had a ton of culture a ton of tradition and a ton of love. So I, I, I always say I was born into wealth and into great privilege. Now, it didn't mean we had a bathroom, but we had a grandmother that just embraced me and nurtured me. Uh, there, there were some setbacks for sure. My father uh, abandoned me when I was two years old. And when I was five, my mother tried to make the journey to the United States undocumented. And she felt that to, to, to do that and to risk... Um, my life at such a young age she couldn't do so she came to the united states without me so my formative years my early years uh, i didn't grow up with a father or a mother i was reunited with my mom close to when i was nine years old and i came to a neighborhood uh in compton california that felt very different uh they spoke a different language and when i came into schools i always felt like uh i was a child that was falling behind during my middle school and, and high school years, I got lost and, and I was coping with a lot of internal pain, not having a father, living in a community where we would see a lot of drive-bys. Uh, there was a lot of different types of violence. Uh, the counselors that I was looking for became alcohol, became other things. And these were not healthy vices. They were my coping mechanisms. And it took a while for me to begin to find uh, my talents. One of them was crying words into a napkin. Uh, that became poetry. Those became words and finding that as therapy. I somehow made it through high school and was one of the first definitely in my family to graduate high school and go on to college. I went on to UC Berkeley and that opened up a whole new world. Um, I went to a high school where the minorities were Cubans and all of the student body was pretty much Mexican American, Mexican, Chicano. So being exposed to young people from Ethiopia, from different parts of Asia, uh, African Americans, uh, Caucasian Americans, other folks was, was amazing. I, I started my undergrad at a time when they acquitted uh, four police officers in the beating of Rodney King. And my political awakening came. I also began to realize that in this country, we were labeled poor. We were labeled illegal aliens. We were labeled wetbacks. I knew that my mother had been deported and I knew it had a tremendous impact on me. I remember being nine years old and mom didn't come home. But it wasn't until I was about 18 years old that I started piecing different things together. And I remember getting my first uh, kind of real job in an after school program. And I saw a lot of kids who looked like me, who didn't seem to have a lot of role models. And I was blessed to have my grandmother. So I think I started to become my grandmother to a lot of kids. And I fell in love with after school programming, with education. 19 plus years later, I've been blessed to be a learner and to be a teacher and to be an educator. 
And it was through that journey that eventually led me here to Harvard to get this doctorate in educational leadership. There are very few people that are accepted into that program. As you know, uh, Harvard University is a very prestigious university, and this particular doctorate is a very unique doctorate. It's the only doctorate of its kind in the country that's only three years. It's for educational practitioners who have been in the field about 15 years or more. I've been in the field almost 20 years. Uh, they only accept 25 people, and to, to accept this cohort, Imagine being accepted to Harvard. It's fully funded and you receive a stipend and you get a doctorate in three years. Who wouldn't want to come? No so the whole application process was very difficult. Um, there was also some issues of self-doubt, issues of uh, this is a totally different community. Uh, Cambridge, there's a lot more uh, wealth here and the reputation that Harvard has is, is mixed it's definitely seen as an educational hub, but it may also be seen as a place of great wealth and privilege that hasn't always distributed in the best of ways. And so being accepted on the one hand was amazing for my community and for me personally and for my family. But on the other hand is, am I going to the place that hasn't really distributed power well? And am I going to become that? And am I going to, to change? And can I really address issues of inequity at a place that doesn't even have a Chicano Latino studies department? Being here just a month and a half at Harvard uh, at, in 2013 has been a very interesting experience. Yeah, I would imagine so, because the Hispanic population, Hispanic Latino population at Harvard is supposedly 12%. I haven't, I haven't seen them. You know, I'm, I'm the first Mexican immigrant male in our program. Uh, in my cohort, there's a total of three of us. And I also think, too, uh, with no disrespect to any of my colleagues, and I'm not speaking about the colleagues in my cohort, there are people here that may have a Latino last name. And there is quite a presence from Latin America who are coming from pretty wealthy families. You have the sons and daughters of presidents of countries here. Certainly. But U.S. born Latinos, you don't see as much. And that's it's no coincidence. There is a center for Latin America studies. And what they mean is you can study the countries of Bolivia, of El Salvador. But can you study Puerto Ricans from the United States or Dominicans or Cubans or Mexican-Americans or Central Americans? No, you can't. Uh, th that scholarship seems to not be worthy here. And so it, it's been really difficult. It's been really difficult when... Um, hardly anyone looks like me, um, shares my worldview, sees issues like immigration in the way that I see them and experience them firsthand. I'm still not a citizen of this country. And so there's been incidents on campus where I've been confused in two instances for the cafeteria worker and for the person who cleans the building. It's humiliating. It's dehumanizing. Yesterday, I left my bag in class. I came back for it and I was bending down and someone came in uh, the door and apologized and said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were cleaning. Um, I purchased this jacket yesterday night um, and um, it has um, the, the, the Harvard insignia and I, I, I'm kind of conducting a study to see if I wear it, if I'll be a little bit more accepted because maybe it's the tattoos that I carry, maybe it's the face that I have, maybe it's the perspective that I bring, but um, it doesn't seem welcomed here. Well, that is going to be an interesting experiment. Um, and and I, I, hope you, I hope you catalog that and write it all down. I, I see it that way, but I, it's also... Um, quite tiring yeah because when do you engage uh I, I was on i was in line at the at the local cafe downstairs of the of the library for the graduate school and someone let me pass um not because they were letting me in line because they assumed that i was going to work at the cafe and they said that oh i thought i thought you worked here and when do you engage and how do you engage and how do you how do you uh, correct ignorance? Um, how do you check for understanding with love? 
How does it not hurt? And in our classes, I don't know if you heard, but uh, in May of this past year, they just gave a doctorate from the Kennedy School, this, the School of Government, proving that Latinos are genetically inferior. We're in 2013. And um, I thought the eugenics movement and the social Darwinist movement uh, was a thing of the past. But it gets cloaked in pseudoscience. And I'm in, so I'm in classes where I'm learning about data that says that parents of color don't know how to parent, that the achievement gaps that exist are really because of our ethnic and ethnic roots in our genes. And so not all of my experience is negative. Not all of my experience is painful. I don't want to paint one picture because there's a thousand pictures to paint. But to tell you that it's been an easy journey, it hasn't. But to tell you that I'm speaking from a place of victimhood, I'm not. Uh, I'm very privileged to be here. I feel very honored to be here. Um, but it has been a difficult struggle.